Welcome back to this ENCA Moneyline special report on our captains of industry where we go beyond the boardroom. Our guest today is Ketzel Gordon. Did you know what role you would like to play in the new South Africa? So what happened in 87 is I spent a little bit of time in detention, which always gives you time to think and yes. reflect. And that's when I realized that I think, you know, change was possible. And so I left the country after I came out of detention to study. And I went to a great institute at the University of Sussex in England, where they teach you about development economics. And there I spent two years learning about why economies succeed, why they fail, what policies work, what policies don't. And we were taught by people who were actually doing research and advising governments and had a meaningful role in, in policy development. So it was a perfect sort of transition yeah. from activist into getting involved in the, the economic policy space. And so when I came back from studying, ANC got on band. I came up to Johannesburg and I've been here ever since. And I joined uh, what was a very rudimentary Department of Economic Policy of the ANC. <laughs> and at that point, obviously formulating what our economic policies would look like um, in future. Tell us about those early days. I, th I think it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because I think the, the Berlin Wall coming down, which is now 25 years ago, clearly impacted on all of us. I was there the, the day the Brandenburg Gate opened, Goodness. and I walked across with two million people. So obviously has it left an indelible mark in my mind about mm. how the world was changing. And we had formulated this very fuzzy middle of the road uh, economic policy, which we called the mixed economy. You know, so of course we wanted the market, but we also wanted the state. And uh, you know, we wanted redistribution, but we also wanted growth. And so we spent a lot of that time in a sense, talking the left of the ANC to the middle yeah. and the right of the ANC to the middle and trying to persuade business that we knew what we were talking about and that we would be responsible uh, in, in the way that the, the country moved forward. And was, that, was that difficult, convincing particularly entrenched business interests at the time in South Africa that these people that they've seen as terrorists, as revolutionaries, who all they knew was to bomb things um, and doi doi, would actually be able to run um, an economy. I mean, I think, I think there were two things that probably influenced the fact that we had a good conversation with business in that period. The one was who made up the department. So in the 91 conference that the ANC had, Trevor Manuel was elected the head of the economics portfolio. We had Tito Mboweni, we had Max Sulu, we had a whole bunch of people who were, I think, quite persuasive in their ability to explain and, and, and in a sense, negotiate. Uh, with business. The second thing that happened was that many of our international allies, when I say ours, I mean the ANCs, like Sweden, yeah. you know, sent their economic advisors, Australia sent their economic advisors, all in, in part of a process to try and say, let's find that middle ground, which addresses what clearly is a need in South Africa which yeah. of growth and redistribution. And, you know, I think the debate went on for, for a very long time and it probably continues it even today. It continues, continues into today. So post-elections, uh, you join the Department of Transport. Yes. Right, so tell us about going into government now, walking into the, these hallowed halls that we've been kept from for such a long time. I was very fortunate because I ended up working with Mac Maharaj as my minister. And the two of us are very similar people we have a very complementary style of work, and you know it was a, it was a, the most incredible five years of my life. So walking in there, I mean, I think the the majority of the, the Department of Transport staff expect, expected us to come in and you know be top down and tell what tell them what to do, and we did exactly the opposite, which is we went in there and we said, come and explain to us how things work. Yeah, we had six very senior vacancies. Everybody expected that it would be six new black people coming in. No, we brought in three new black people and we promoted three internally. Mm. We never changed the official language in which you needed to write reports because we were flexible. If you were writing to another person who understood Afrikaans, it was okay to write Afrikaans. But if you were writing it to me or the minister, then it had to be in English. So this style where we accommodated and showed that we were fair and reasonable, I think created an environment where people gave the best of themselves. You moved on from the Department of Transport. Why did you move and where to? I moved on because we understood that there would be a transition 
and it's not very cool to have both the DG and the minister leave at the same time. So we wanted a transition where the DG would be a continuity. So we appointed somebody a, a year before my term was up yeah. and so that he could overlap with the new minister. And it was all in the interest of having some level of continuity in, in, in the department. I moved on to another job in government. I went to become the city manager of Johannesburg. And I was hired specifically because the city was in a crisis, a uh, financial crisis, and they needed somebody that would do two things, resolve the crisis and help create a single authority, which is what we have today, which is the Metropolitan mm. Council of Johannesburg. After leaving that uh, job, or at least not having your contract renewed, you stayed within the public sector? No, I moved on then, yeah. uh, because I couldn't find a meaningful enough job in the public sector at the time. I did apply for a couple of things, didn't work out. So I ended up becoming something which I had never ever thought I would. I became an investment banker. <laughs> and I worked in the field of private equity and worked for RMB, which was probably one of the most successful banks involved in the private equity uh, space. And I ran that business for seven or eight years. Just tell us what you think the main difference is. Was there any stark change when you went from the public sector into the private sector? I think that the private sector guys are not going to like what I say, but the private sector is a lot less complicated, a lot less stressful, and a lot less challenging. Because even in the most complex private equity deal, you were probably dealing with about four or five variables. In the city, on any issue, whether it was transport or housing or water, there were at least 15 variables. So you were doing it with a lot less resources. Mm. We turn, turned around the city without a single chartered accountant working in the city. In RMB, we probably had 20 on each floor. Goodness. You know, so it's a, it's a, a well-resourced place with very competent people who are man, mainly self-starters. Uh, and so it's a very easy environment in which to, to manage. And if you were to, if you were to, to speak to a someone who's in the pri pri private sector right now who might be considering going into the public sector, what advice would you give them? I think the main advice is that make sure that you have a political boss that you believe in, because if you don't, that relationship is not going to work out. Two is don't take the job unless you are the boss and you have the power because those are the two things that allow you to make a difference in the public sector today. You know, the rest, the rest of the people you know, suffer from both those issues. Either they don't have enough influence or they don't have a relationship of trust with their political boss. Yeah. And we see that every day. Do we have activist CEOs um, in South Africa who look not just at the bottom line, but also um, the welfare of their, their, their employees, the welfare of the communities within which they operate? I think, I think those kinds of CEOs exist. We are in the minority. I count myself amongst those because one of the things I tried to do in my last job at PPC was basically create a model of what a corporate in South Africa could look like. And the defining features were narrowing the wage gap, making sure that every worker had an asset, as in a house, to pass on to the next generation. And thirdly, that they had a more than meaningful amount of equity in the business. And, you know, I think the, the story around the equity is quite important. Yeah. Everybody is in the economic world is talking about Piketty's book. And, you know, the one key line he, he, he makes in that book is that the return on equity has outstripped the return on labor and, and growth and income. So the owners of PPC shares have, in general, done better than the employees of PPC. Mm. The only way you can equal, equalize that in some ways is for the employees to become meaningful shareholders in the business. Uh -huh. So I think, you know, in South Africa, defining what a progressive or a uh, conscious yeah. CEO should be doing is very easy. I think those are the three priority things. We can add education and yes. bursaries and other bits and pieces. But for me, if we don't change the lives of the next generation, then I think we've missed an opportunity to make the transition. After the break, we look to the future and the kind of South Africa Keto would like to see. This is ENCA Moneyline, your money guide. Stay with us.